Yeah. Hey, how's it going, everyone? This is the Anime Man. Unpopular opinions. You hate them. I debate them. So let's fight! Hell yeah, we're back at it again, my boys. It's the show where I ask you guys over on my Twitter, shameless plug, for your controversial opinions and your fighting words about all sorts of shit concerning anime, manga, the otaku sphere, and the general Japanese culture. And I take a bunch of those that I think I can fight against, and I... And I fight against them. Yes, this is the show that gets me easily the most dislikes and easily the most cancerous of cancerous comment sections, but I just fucking love doing it. You guys love watching it, so let's just do another one of these, shall we? Cut the chit chat, let's put on the boxing gloves, and without further ado, let's fucking fight! Occultic 9 was a brilliant show that got way too much shit than it deserved. Uh, no. I did a very short review of Occultic 9 in, in, a, in a video some time ago, like, like as it finished. I, I watched the whole thing because I heard that it was set in the semicolon universe, as we like to call it. I'm talking about, you know, same universe as Robotic Notes, Steins Gate, Chaos Head, and the fourth entry in that was Occultic 9. And, you know, I'm a huge fan of the semicolon universe. I've seen all three other series, you know, varying in reviews. Like, I thought Chaos Head was kind of shit. Steins Gate some fucking masterpiece. Robotics Notes was just okay. And I feel Occultic 9 kind of fell into the same realm as Robotics Notes. It was just okay. I mean, the fact that they squeeze the entire first novel into the first episode of the anime goes to show that, yeah, the pacing wasn't the most amazing. And you know, it's very tradition for any of the series coming from the semicolon universe that the first couple of episodes is usually quite long and drawn out. It usually requires a lot of world building because it is usually filled with an extensive plot with all sorts of branching paths for different characters. I mean, in the case of Steinsgate, they took the entire first 10 to 11 episodes to build up the world, but luckily the payoff in the second half was amazing. And I really appreciate Occultic 9 for its rather unique way of dramatizing and the unique ways that they directed the show itself. I mean, I definitely do have to give props to the director of Occultic 9 for giving us all sorts of different types of shots that we didn't really see a lot of in the other semicolon series, especially because Occultic 9 was definitely a lot more of a thriller and horror based series compared to the other three. But still, it was kind of just okay. A lot like Robotics Notes, like, it was a decent ride while watching it, but after the series finished, I kind of just forgot about it. It definitely didn't ingrain itself in my head in the same way that Steins Gates did. Yu Yu Hakusho was technically an isekai because Truck-kun's cousin Kuruma-kun sent Yusuke to the spirit world. <laughs> Spoilers? No, I'm just kidding, it's not spoilers. It literally happens in the first frame of the manga. See, I can't really disagree with you there because, like, what is the definition of an isekai? What does the word isekai mean? Isekai is a Japanese word which means another world. So, people are usually pretty quick to assuming that an isekai show needs to do something with some kind of game world or some kind of JRPG world, since a lot of the very popular isekai shows, or those that have been labelled isekai shows, usually fall under that pot setting. But technically speaking, doesn't a spirit world, for example, also count as an isekai, it is technically another world, right? Because yes, Yusuke does die, he turns into a ghost, and he goes up to the spirit world to try and come back to life. Two different worlds. Wouldn't you say that he went to an isekai? I think the problem lies in the fact that we've recently started to label isekai as an actual genre of anime, when it's really not. It really annoys the fuck out of me when people take these, like, settings in anime, and that occurs so often that we just had to label it under a genre. For example, I see people calling shows like School Rumble or Ore Ga Iru in the genre of school. Like, what the fuck is that supposed to mean? Oh, it's set in a school, so I guess the genre of it is school. What? School is the setting that the show is placed in, 
not the genre of the show. And isekai is kind of the same thing if you think about it. It's just a setting. It is set in an isekai in another world. But there is no such genre of anime as isekai. That's like me saying, oh, I love One Piece. It's my favorite pirate anime. Because you all know that uh, the pirate genre is my favorite genre of anime. That sounds fucking stupid, right? Kind of the same thing with isekai in my opinion. Like no one calls Bleach an isekai because technically it is an isekai. Ichigo dies and goes to the spirit world. Another world. Isekai! The dots connect, see? So yes, Yu Yu Hakusho is technically an isekai show, and there is no such thing as the isekai genre in anime. It is just my opinion, but I think that Lupin the Third is underrated and don't get much love, especially from the new generation. I may be wrong, but that's how I feel. And you know what? I absolutely agree with that. Lupin the Third is an incredible, incredible series that has, oddly enough, not age that much as people like to think. Like, yes, it is an old show. If you go back and watch the first season of Lupin the Third, the original season, or even go and watch the first movie, yes, it is an old franchise, but that doesn't mean that it's not suited for the young'uns, the millennials of this generation. Because in my mind, Lupin the Third, Castle of Cagliostro is one of the greatest anime films ever created. And the Lupin the Third series itself is an extremely influential series that influenced some of the biggest series that we know today, like Detective Conan. So I implore you youngins who have possibly never heard of Lupin the Third, or perhaps you've heard of Lupin the Third, you've never seen it before, go watch Castle of Cagliostro and come back to me and tell me how much of a fucking beast of a movie that thing is. The slow pacing of shows which others call amazing, such as Mob, Bunny Girl, etc, really puts me off as it bores me out of my mind. I can't understand what a attracts audiences to these mind-numbingly boring shows or why they are worth people's time. See, I feel the person who tweeted this at me is probably prone to only watching one type of anime, and that is most likely shonen anime. A lot of shonen anime is very quick to the punch because it is suited for a younger audience hence the genre shonen. Whereas series that are a little bit more experimental, series that are targeted more towards an older demographic, you know, those that are in the seinen or the jose genre, usually tend to have a lot more of a slower pacing. But I think it's really important to distinguish slow pacing with unnecessarily slow pacing. For example, I mentioned earlier the series Steinsgate having a rather slow start. The first 10 episodes is usually just there for world building and not a whole lot happens. But the thing is, is that the first 10 episodes of Steingate is not unnecessarily slow. It needs to be slow because it needs to unpack so much information that will become integral to understanding the latter half of the story. Another example of slow pacing that is actually done with justice would be a series like Serial Experiments Lane. Because it is very dialogue heavy, not a lot of action happens, it might tend to look and feel slow for some people or some viewers of anime who are not used to this kind of pacing. They're more used to shonen or shoujo type of plot pacing, which is usually very quick. There's always a lot of things happening at once so that the younger audience can pay attention and stay paid attention. But Serial Experiments Lane and Steins Gate are both 10 out of 10 series, even though it has a slow pacing. And don't get me wrong, I love me my shonen and shoujo stuff too. That's that fast pacing shit, I love it. I fucking love it. But I can also sit down and appreciate a slowly brothing series rather than just a quick flip in the frying pan. I may be an elitist, but anime that claim they have a message, but it is either non-existent or stupid, are way worse than guilty pleasure anime. I'm thinking Mirai Nikki, Elf and Lead, latter is not as bad as the former, Steins Gate Zero. Okay, first of all, I don't understand what you're talking about with non-existent or stupid messages when it comes to shows like Mirai Nikki. Nikki. Mirai Nikki d doesn't have a deep message to it. It's just a battle royale show for people who want to see attractive characters killing each other in a horror setting. And in the case with Elf and Elite, yes, it does have a message behind it. It has that message of family, what it means to be family, what it means to be human. But it is not necessarily an extremely deep message. But 
is still important regardless because it is a great message that people use to really relate to characters like Lucy. If there was no message behind Elf and Lee, it would just be another Mirai Nikki clone. Or I guess Elf and Lee came first, so Mirai Nikki would be an Elf and Lee clone. But it's not. Elf and Lee has a message to it, regardless of whether you think it is deep or pointless or anything. And I think if you watch an anime that has some level of message behind it and you deem it to be pointless or stupid, then that's your prerogative, my dude. You're clearly just not into shows that have that kind of messaging behind it. You're clearly just not into shows with the whole family message, the whole what it means to be human message. Yes, it isn't exactly the most unique message out there because there are literally hundreds of anime and other cartoons and movies and shows that do explore similar types of messages. But I think what's important with those kinds of messages that you see so often in media is how they decide to explore it, how they decide to present it. Because I found the way that Elf and Leet kind of dug deep and explored this messaging of what it means to be human, what it means to be family, was a pretty unique way of doing it. It's, it's If you think about it, it's kind of a counterintuitive way of thinking about it because it, it is a very subtle message, it is a very warm and closed in message, a very, a message that, you know, you protect quite a bit and is usually coupled with rather friendly, family friendly and very warm and charming shows. Meanwhile, you have a show like Elf and Lee, which is anything but warm and charming. If anything, I want to know what type of messaging behind a show you deem to be suitable to your taste. Like, if, if a show like Elf and Lee doesn't impress you or at least get you thinking or, you know, kind of be like, wow, okay, they explored it in this way, that's kind of interesting, then I want to know, like, what's a show that did that for you? Because I thought that the way that, you know, El shows like Elf and Lead explored its messaging was actually kind of interesting. When a character gets rejected or friendzoned, so many anime fans feel so bad for female characters while meme, aka mock, male characters. Oh, and they call male characters names when they dump a girl. Jesus, man. Yeah. It's kind of like real life. I'm tired of people bashing and hating long-running shonen such as One Piece, Naruto, Hunter x Hunter, MHA, FMA, DBZ. Oh, it's mainstream, some weeb will say. You know what? Fuck you. These anime have gained popularity of mass audience above those weebs. You know what? I somewhat agree with this statement. So many people think that I just hate all mainstream shows altogether, which is absolutely not the case. If anything, about half of the shows that are listed here in this tweet, I actually quite enjoy. Like, I love me some One Piece, I love Hunter x Hunter, I love FMA, I love DBZ. Naruto I wasn't the biggest fan of, and MHA is alright, I guess. But I absolutely don't understand people who just hate all shonen or all shoujo series altogether. Like, what the fuck type of anime did you start watching in that case? Like, do you just not find any joy watching any of these shows? Like, do, do you really think that all mainstream shows are trash immediately because it's loved by a large audience? No, absolutely not. And so many people think that people like me, who love to criticize different shows and who love to quote unquote hate on the popular stuff, even though I really don't, are like universal haters of all shonen and shoujo manga and anime. And I'm like, nah, bro, I, I quite like my shonen and shoujo. Like, I, I grew up with that shit, like everybody else. I'm just not a fan of specific shonen and shoujo. And usually, those specific shonen and shoujo series I'm not a huge fan of also have a lot large demographic that usually cross over to other larger demographics that I am enjoying, I, that I am a part of. And so word gets around that, oh, Joey the Anime Man hates all shonen shows because he doesn't like Naruto. It's like, what? Grappler Bucky was one of the all-time worst animes ever made. We watched a couple episodes of it in my anime club and we all agree it made SAO look good. I mean, I don't know what I was expecting from a person with a happy profile picture so yeah let's let's just it, it's i think it's safe to say that whoever this person is has very low standards when it comes to anime and that's all i'm gonna say now excuse me while i go and read the bible Reading romance shoujo manga is not embarrassing. I read a lot of manga in this genre and I can absolutely identify all the stupid moments if there are any. I'm not delusional, I can think critically, and cute guys are not the only thing I look for in manga. ab so fuck king lutely you know what it is i think the people and specifically guys who are like oh you read shoujo manga 
what the fuck is wrong with you, usually have some kind of dilemma when it comes to their sexuality. And look, I'm not gonna go too deep into the whole sexuality argument because that's, that's always a losing war regardless of which side you take. I think those people, and again, especially guys who have never read shoujo manga or who think that their masculinity is gonna get tarnished because they're reading something that's for girls, ew. Uh, like, just... They're in the losing race, bro. Like, you're missing out on a lot of fucking good shows. I mean, your boy, for example, grew up watching and reading Sailor Moon, which is like the pinnacle of shoujo manga and anime. And like, yeah, I'm not gonna say that Sailor Moon is the most perfect manga or perfect anime out there. Of course, it has its problems, but I still fucking love it. I don't give a shit if it's for girls. I love that shit. Like, people think that, you know, shoujo is just full of cliche romantic bullshit and I mean yeah there is a lot of it don't get me wrong but that doesn't mean that every other genre is also safe from that whole stigmatization and that whole trope and clicheness. Because prepare to get your mind blown, there are just as many cliche and tropey shit moments in shonen manga as there is in shoujo manga. Not every shoujo manga is amazing, but not every shonen manga is amazing. Mind blown, I know. Go read Sailor Moon. Most Obscure Anime is an anime that did not get much recognition because it's just trash. What are you talking about? The reason why a show is obscure does not necessarily have to come down to the fact that it's a shit show. Yes, absolutely, I'm not saying that all obscure shows are amazing diamonds in the rough that are ready to be excavated by the community. No, of course. Like, there are so many obscure shows that, again, as you say, are sh obscure because they're most likely shit. But there are other reasons why shows become obscure in the anime world. Sometimes it is because the show itself came out at the wrong time, regardless of if it came out too early or if it came out too late. For example, shows like Serial Experiments Lane, Ergo Proxy, and Technolize are three shows that people can safely say are obscure. These shows are obscure not because they're bad. If anything, these three shows are fucking amazing. These three shows are obscure because the core demographic that these shows were targeted towards were very, very small at the time that these shows came out. These three shows didn't come out at a time where all anime was ready to be streamed online for every single person in the world to enjoy. No, these were shows that you could only either watch on TV or by buying expensive as fuck blue Rays and DVDs, which, surprise, no one fucking buys. Meanwhile, you have other shows like Haito Genso no Grimgar, which just came out at a time where Isekai was fucking everywhere. Isekai shows were the huge thing, and it just missed its boat to the point where no one really talks about it anymore. I mean, also the fact that it was kind of just a shit show in general, but that's besides the point. But the thing is, nowadays, less and less shows are becoming obscure because everything is easily accessible. And because everything is easily accessible, everything gets found, everything gets watched by some level of an audience. Yes, every season there are usually like the top five shows that every single person and their mothers are watching. And so therefore, like the remaining 45 shows become quote unquote obscure. But that doesn't mean that all of those obscure shows are shit. In fact, there are a lot of diamonds in the rough that haven't been excavated yet. Madoka Magica is overrated as hell and does not deserve a half of the positive attention it gets. I disagree with that because Madoka Magica was one of the first really, really successful examples of a show that blended two genres seemingly together, two genres of which, by the way, people never thought would work in execution, and that was the magical girl and the horror genres. I mean, technically speaking, Magical Magica wasn't the first show to blend those two genres together. If anything, the aforementioned Sailor Moon was the first show to really take this whole magical girl concept and give it a really horrific groundwork. Give it something, give it something that was just a little bit off about the whole bubbly and rainbowy world of the magical girl and really ground it down to a level that was really fucking real if you think about it. Madoka Magica basically took the concept of shows like Sailor Moon and just cranked the horror factor way higher than Sailor Moon ever took it. And what came out was a magical girl show 
taken and presented in a way that at the time, no one had ever thought would work in reality. And I mean, look at all of the shows nowadays that were inspired from shows like Madoka Manka. Like, look at all of the Magical Girl X horror shows and horror manga that have come out since the huge success of Madoka Manka. So, no, I don't think Madoka Manka is overrated. And if anything, if I were to just dig in a little bit deeper, the first Madoka Manka movie is a fucking amazing movie that everybody should watch. Like, bro, you have a problem with Magical Girl shows? Are men not allowed to enjoy it because it's a Magical Girl show? It's for girls? Like, shut up, dude. Go watch Madoka Magica. The fact that only Japan has a sizable animation industry is limiting the potential of the animation medium. More competition is better. If countries like USA and South Korea produce more animations, we will get more variety and good shows per season. Okay, first of all, there already is an animation industry in the US. Have you ever heard of The Simpsons, Family Guy, South Park, every single show on Cartoon Network and Adult Swim? Those are technically animations. And in the case with countries like South Korea and let's let's throw in China as well as well because they're, they're really starting to make a name for themselves, especially in the anime industry rather than just the general animation industry. Anime shows, these Japanese animation styled shows that come out of countries like China and South Korea and Indonesia and other Asian countries and basically all other countries outside of Japan are currently put under a stigma, and that stigma is that if it's not from Japan, it's not anime. So if anything, we can argue that the reason why the animation industries in South Korea and China and basically every single country outside of Japan isn't growing and flourishing as much as it should is because of us, of, of the community basically stopping them and being like, no, no, you think you're anime. But you're not. The problem is us, ladies and gentlemen. I, I don't think we realize that. The, the fact that we are the ones who are basically being like, you guys aren't anime, you wish you were anime, but you're not. And basically stopping it is basically stopping the growth of these animation industries, especially those that are trying to get as close to the Japanese animation industry as they possibly can. The answer was right under our noses the whole time. And finally, Nausicaa is superior to Mononoke Hime, and Nausicaa is also the best Ghibli film. They both have the same morals, stopping pollution, etc., but Nausicaa does it in a much more smarter way, like her garden which had one poisonous plant but a safe now, etc., etc. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm about to destroy this particular argument in six words. Ready? Nausicaa is not a Ghibli film. Nausicaa was made in 1984. Ghibli was established in 1985. Point invalid. But I will admit, they're both amazing movies, so so we'll, we'll, we'll call it there. That's gonna do it for this episode of Let's Fight. Thank you for joining in once again to the very, very end. What did you think of any of the tweets and the counter arguments that I gave to those tweets? Let me know all that kind of stuff in the comments below. And if you'd like to join in on the next episode of Let's Fight, then make sure to follow your boy over on Twitter and send me your unpopular opinions using that hashtag, Let's Fight. Fight. And if you have an interesting enough unpopular opinion about something that I would like to fight back on, then you might see yourself in the next episode of Let's Fight. But if you enjoyed this video, make sure to smack the fuck out of that like button. I appreciate it a lot, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching, like and favorite if you enjoyed, subscribe for more new banner, and keep watching anime. Johnny.